Good evening and welcome to Peace IT's webinar for TNI, that's Techno Technology and Integration Support. Tonight we will be discussing CompTIA's Network Plus exam in 10-005 and specifically we will be talking about Objective 3.3. Again, good evening. I'm Brian Farrell, and I am the instructor instructor for Peace IT's TNI program. I'm also an instructor for Edmonds Community College, uh, particularly the CIS 205 course, which surprisingly enough correlates directly to uh, Peace's TNI program. There's a few of my certifications and qualifications. And with that, let's go ahead and move forward. You're probably wondering um, what exam objective 3.3 is. Well, it's compare and contrast different wireless standards. So that's what we will, we will be covering this evening. So let's go ahead and jump in on tonight's webinar. So like I said before, we're going to be comparing and contrasting different wireless standards. Before we begin, let's talk about wireless networking a little bit. Excuse me. Yeah, let's talk about wireless networking just a little bit. So the wireless networking standards are established by the 802.11 Committee of the Institute of Electrical and Electronics Engineers, the IEEE. So when people say, talk about a Wi-Fi network, when they're talking about Wi-Fi, they're not really talking about the 802.11 standards, even though that's what they mean. What they're really talking about is the Wi-Fi Alliance. Now the Wi-Fi Alliance is actually the organization that is responsible for making sure that the equipment meets the standards set in the 802.11 committee. The Wi-Fi really has nothing to do with the standards, but it's come to be known as a wireless local area network just because we've used it so much. That's kind of like aspirin and Band-Aid. But just so you know, Wi-Fi is actually not part of the standard. They are the organization that ensures that that equipment that you buy meets the standards. Now let's talk about those standards a little bit more. Let's talk about the 802.11 base standards. Now this describes a method of half duplex networking by using a portion of the radio frequency spectrum or the RF spectrum. So what's half duplex? Half duplex describes a method of network communication in which a device can send a signal or a message or it can receive a signal or a message, but it cannot do both at the same time. If it could both send and receive at the same time, it would be full duplex and that would involve actually a wired connection and a switch. Now when we're talking about wireless networking, the most common radio frequency bands are the 2.4 gigahertz ISM band, which is the industrial scientific and medical band, or the 5 gigahertz UNI, U -N -I -I, Ban, which is the Unlicensed National Information Infrastructure Ban. These RF bands are used because in the United States they can be used or utilized without a license from the Federal Communications Commission. There are a couple of other frequency spectrums that you can use, um, but most of those would require you to get an FCC license and that just gets kind of cumbersome and nobody really wants to go down that road. Now all wireless Ethernet standards employ an algorithm called Carrier Sense Multiple Access with Collision Avoidance, CSMACA. Now this is a network te technology that involves a method of transmission that avoids packet collisions. How does it work? 
if a noter device wants to send, it it listens to the carrier wave. If no other node is transmitting, it will then transmit. If another node is transmitting, or another device is transmitting, it will wait a random amount of time, and then it will listen in again. Now, every device that's on a wireless network does this to send and receive data or network traffic. Now, this does differ from CSMACD, which is collision, or excuse me, carrier sense multiple access with collision detection, which is all about how to transmit uh, data or how to transmit after a collision has occurred. Now, CSMACD is the wired Ethernet standard, but CSMACA is the wireless standard. So let's talk a little bit more, and we're going to talk about frequency modulation. Good evening, Gabriella. So frequency modulation is what is used to encode data into a carrier wave. Uh, the 802.11 standard uses two main frequency modulation methods. The first one is OFDM, or orthogonal frequency division multiplexing. That's why we call it OFDM. The other way is just too, too much of a mouthful. OFDM is a frequency division multiplexing scheme that uses multiple subcarrier channels to carry data. OFDM is used to mitigate against loss of signal strength over distance. That means OFDM can go a farther distance than other frequency modulation methods. Then there is direct sequence spec. Uh, Direct Sequence Spread Spectrum, DSSS. Now, DSSS is a modulation technique that uses a spread, spread spectrum technology to do the data transfer. Now, DSSS is used to mitigate the problem of having multiple users on the same channel, and it's effective for the timing between the transmitter and the receiver. That means with DSSS, you can get more users on a single channel, but you can't go as far as you can with OFDM. Now that we have those basics covered, let's move on to the standards themselves. And first up is the 802.11a. Uh, Normally, I start off with the 802.11b, because it actually came out before A, but we'll start with A this evening. It has a max throughput of 54 megabits per second on the 5 gigahertz frequency band, or RF band. There are 23 uh, channels that are available to 802.11a. From here on out, I'm just going to go .11 and then whatever version it is. Now, those 23 channels are each 20 megahertz wide, so they offer 20 megahertz of bandwidth. And the channels do not overlap. Dot 11A does use OFDM for its modulation, and it has a maximum indoor distance of 115 feet and a maximum outdoor distance of 390 feet. And it is only compatible with dot 11A. It is not compatible with any other standard. Now, I gave you the max distance of 115 feet indoors. If you're 115 feet away from the wireless access point, do not expect to get 54 megabits per second. It doesn't work that way. The farther away you get from the transmitter, the weaker the signal, the slower the speed. Then we have dot 11B. Now it had a max, theo, max throughput of 11 megabits per second on the 2.4 gigahertz RF band. It offered 11 channels, separate channels. Each channel was 22 megahertz in bandwidth. Out of those channels, only three of those channels do not overlap, and that would be channels 1, 6, and 11. 
now dot 11b does use DSSS modulation and it had a max indoor distance also of 115 feet and a maximum outdoor distance of 460 feet. Now dot 11b is compatible with dot 11b, dot 11g, and dot 11n. Now 11b came out first I'm not quite sure why, but 11A quickly followed. People were excited by 11A uh, because of the the more throughput, the larger throughput. But what they quickly discovered was that um, 11A, dot 11A was a little bit more touchy. Uh, the other thing that you need to be aware of is in the frequencies. The higher the frequency, the shorter the distance it can travel without uh, interference causing an issue. Well, 5 gigahertz is almost twice as much as the 2.4. Actually, it's more than twice. What do you know? I can do math every once in a while. Uh, so while people were really excited when dot .11a came out because of the throughput, uh, everybody pretty much went back to 11b just because it was easier to deal with. And then we have dot .11g. Now dot .11g has a max throughput of 54 megabits per second on the 2.4 gigahertz RF band. Just like 11b, it offers 11 channels. Each channel is 22 megahertz wide. And again, only three of those channels did not overlap, 1, 6, and 11. Now, dot 11G could use OFDM or it could use DSSS modulation. Now, it had a max indoor distance of 125 feet, so you could go a little bit farther than with 11B. And it also offered a max distance of 460 feet outdoors. Now, dot 11 G is compatible with dot 11B, 11G, and 11N. So here we go. Well, now we're starting to achieve the same speeds that were capable on 11A, but we still had uh, a lot of the positives that we had from the slower 11B. That 54 megabits per second was actually pretty good in the when it first came out, actually, for a couple of years after it came out. But as more and more people installed wireless networking, uh, we started to lose that performance gain and it became a little bit more of an issue. So they were looking for ways to improve performance. And one of the things that they came up with was multiple input and multiple output, MIMO technology. Now MIMO uses multiple antennas to make multiple simultaneous connections. This does create the ability to achieve faster speeds. Uh, MIMO, part of the way that MIMO created those faster speeds is through channel bonding. Channel bonding is where a device can use multiple radio signals at the same time for transmitting data. So what it did is it took two of those antennas or three of those antennas depending upon the setup and it would use those antennas and it would bond them together. So instead of having uh, say a 22 megahertz wide channel, you could have a 66 megahertz wide channel. Much more throughput. Uh, not necessarily any faster. Faster. There's a difference between um, physical speed and bandwidth, by the way. But you could get more data through. So the throughput was higher. The other thing that came along with NEMO was uh, the beam forming. Now this is a technology in which a multiple antenna technology that helps to reduce weak or dead spots because the antennas can adjust their output once a connection has been made with a device. So it can kind of actually form its transmitting signal so it wasn't just wasting signal. You could get a more solid connection. You could get a, with that solid connection came better throughput. Now that we've discussed the basics of MIMO, let's talk about 802.11n. 
Now, dot 11N has a max throughput of around 600 megabits per second, and it can use the 2.4 or the 5 gigahertz frequencies. That's because if it is a true dot 11N piece of equipment, it's actually got two radio transmitters and two receivers built into it. Dot 11N does use OFDM modulation. It has a max indoor distance of 230 feet, a max outdoor distance of 820 feet. Now, dot 11N is compatible with dot 11B, dot 11G, dot 11N, and dot 11AC. With dot 11N, we had the beginnings of MIMO. We had four, up to four antennas. And that would give you four spatial streams and a, a very rudimentary type of channel bonding. So again, that was pretty fast. It's still, it's still pretty much the standard today. But, you know, time marches on, technology improves, so on and so forth. And that 600 megabits per second just, just wasn't quite cutting it. So along comes dot 11 ac Now, dot 11 ac has a max speed of 433 megabits up to multiples of gigabits per second. Now, this does have to occur on the 5 gigahertz frequency, which means that you don't quite get the distance, but then you get a whole lot more throughput. Uh, it uses OFBM modulation, and it's a special advanced implementation of it. Now, your indoor distance dropped back down to 115 feet, and your theoretical outdoor distance went to drop back down to 300 feet. And I say theoretical, and actually both of those are theoretical because at the time that the, the uh, standards were uh, established, they still hadn't quite gotten that nailed down. So those are just rough estimates right there. Now, 11AC is compatible with 11G, 11N, and 11AC. It is not compatible with 11B. Now, 11AC does use a type of MIMO, multiple input, multiple output technology. As a matter of fact, it uses a type of MIMO that is called MU MIMO. Kind of goofy sounded, but that's M-U hyphen M-I-M-O. That's a multiple user, multiple input, multiple output, and it gives you up to eight antennas, which gives you eight spatial streams. That's how you get the speed. Uh, beam forming was further advanced with dot 11AC. As a matter of fact, dot 11AC performs beam forming very well, much better than dot 11N. So let's move on to some encryption standards for 802.11 networks. First up is Wired Equivalent Privacy, or WEP. Now, that says Wired Equivalent, equivalent Privacy. That's what they were shooting for. That's not what they received. Uh, as a matter of fact, WEP is not very private at all. It was in, introduced in 1999. And it, it works by using a key and the RC algorithm to encrypt the signal. The key was used to decrypt that scrambled data. Now, if you notice, it came out in 1999. Well, WIP was fully broken in 2001. As a matter of fact, if you're using a WEP encryption, WEP encrypted network, it takes a hacker just a couple of minutes and they're into your network. Do not use WEP. Well, it's better than nothing, but really, do not use WEP. WEP was originally replaced by Wi-Fi Protected Access, or WPA, which was introduced in 2003. Now, WPA was a stopgap measure. Uh, WEP was so severely broken but there was so much equipment out there that used WEP that um, they developed WPA as a means of protecting that equipment 
giving people and businesses an opportunity to, to get more advanced equipment, but still use their old equipment in the same time, at the same time. Now, WEP used, or it's WEP, WPA used the same RC4 algorithm as WEP, but it also introduced temporal key integrity protocol, TKIP. Now, what TKIP does is it ensures that each packet uses a, a unique encryption key. Now, WEP, now WPA is better than WEP, but WPA can still be easily broken. Instead of just a couple of minutes, it might take that hacker 10 or 15 minutes, but they will break into your network if you're using WPA, even with TKIP. The whole goal all along was to introduce WPA2, Wi-Fi Protected Access 2, which was introduced or finalized in 2004. It's much more advanced than earlier standards, and it introduced AES, Advanced Encryption Standard, to the wireless process. AES is a symmetrical encryption standard, symmetrical meaning that the same key is used to encrypt it as what is used to decrypt it. And AES is very robust. As a matter of fact, even though it came out in 2004, it is still the standard that we're using today. There is a, actually a bounty out there that um, for somebody to actually prove that they can effectively uh, break into a WPA2 AES encrypted network within a reasonable amount of time, nobody is yet to collect the bounty. Now, here's a caveat. Um, because network traffic is broadcast over an unlicensed radio frequency band, they tend to be less secure than wired networks. On a wired network, you can somewhat control who can see the data, who can see the traffic, who connects to the network. Much harder to do on a wireless network. <laughs> the other thing to keep in mind is that when you are on a wireless network, or when you set one up, make sure you use the proper encryption standards and never leave your wireless network unsecured. Never leave that door open for somebody to break into your network. And if you are using a public wireless network, say you're at Starbucks, take care and caution. Use some common sense. While it might be somewhat secure, you, since you're not the one in control of that network, you cannot be completely positive how secure that network is. Now that concludes my uh, all of the information that I have for this evening's webinar. Thank you for attending.